Hello, everybody. Welcome to the webinar. Thank you for joining us here on a Wednesday afternoon, wherever you are joining from in the world. We're very much looking forward to sharing this hour with you here today, a journey which is going to take us into a very sort of new area of education, which is important for us as educators, as partners of education, as parents and as students. And we're going to look at schooling, education, and ideas which really come from the world of industry, ideas about quality management, so total quality management and education. So we're gonna look at that in the context of academics. What do we need to teach children today and students? And also, how do we create an education environment that allows us to do it? And how do we constantly improve that environment so we stay relevant, stay up to date? Because we all know how challenging it is to teach, to learn, in an environment where the skills we need are constantly changing. So welcome to the webinar. My name's Graham Brown. I'm going to be your guide for the hour. I'm going to ask you questions, the audience. I'm also going to introduce our guests very shortly. But first up, I'd like to hear from you. If you're new to this game, then let me show you where the chat box is. At the bottom of your screen there, there's an icon that says, chat what i want you to do is just say hello it'll be great to know where everybody is coming from today so where are you joining us from today in the webinar room be great to know so in the chat box just say hi if you've joined us from a previous session thank you very much for being back and joining us for a part two or maybe a part three this is the third one that you have joined. Great to hear from you all. Um, just say hi. And like, if you've joined us on a previous webinar, we'd like to know as well. If you joined us for part one with Atul or part two with Kapil, uh, would like to know that as well. So just say that hi in the chat box. We're getting some initial hellos here. Hello from Tokyo was the first one. Obviously, that was going to be first. Another hi. Um, hello from GIIS Bangalore attended the previous session. That's great to hear. So we have a global audience. Usually we have a lot of coverage in Asia. Hello again from Tokyo. GIS Tokyo again is well represented today. Hello from Malaysia. Hello, Malaysia. Thank you for joining us and joining us for a part three from Singapore. Thank you very much, Gitika. Great to see you. Hello from Tokyo. Oh, they're all coming now. Hello from Malaysia, joined part one and part two, and now is back for part three. That's Sachin Singh. Thank you very much, Sachin. More from Tokyo. Hello, Tokyo. And hello from the Tokyo, oh, hello from Tokyo, Embassy of Ghana. Hello. So thank you very much for joining us. I know you are all busy people, so hopefully we can make this hour a very useful hour for you because we're going to learn. This is all about learning. This is all about learning the journey of Global Schools Foundation into education. Hello from Singapore as well, just reading some of them out. Um, this is a journey and we're trying to capture this journey with our esteemed guests on the podcast. So everything we talk about today will be available on the podcast. So if you miss some of the aspects of today or you wanna catch up, you wanna go and check out episode one, episode two, um, you might want to check out some of the future episodes. Just take your phone, you know what to do, and QR code it. Scan that QR code. Take a photo of that QR code. And this is what it will do. It will take you to the Spotify page for the School of the Future podcast, where you can learn about everything we talk about today, and you can catch up, review. And what a great way for you to really go deep into the conversation today because there's going to be a lot of information, a lot of information and data coming today. So it's going to be, sometimes you might miss some of it. So you might want to review. So you be our guest, go to the School of the Future podcast on Spotify, subscribe to it there and follow along on the journey, join us on this journey. 
and our guides today on this journey. I'm joined by two esteemed guests from the world of education in very different aspects, educators for life, a lifelong passion. Um, Marukana and Yamada Shu have joined us from Tokyo. Thank you very much for joining us and welcome to the show. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you all today. Thank you, Graham, for inviting me here. Thank you, Mado. And thank you. I'm sure a lot of people here today know you personally or professionally through work. So if you know Madhu, then please say hi in the chat box. Yamada Sensei, welcome to hello. the webinar. Thank, thank you very much. You. And I'm very happy to be here. And hello, everybody. Thanks for your participation. Thank you very much for your participation and looking forward to the insights as well the expertise that you're going to share on total quality management and thank you so much for doing this in english as well i know it's not easy to do a webinar anyway but to do it in your non-native language i think is a real feat of skill so thank you very much for that let's get started today folks we'll introduce the guests very shortly and ask them to tell a little bit about their story as well and what they have to offer us today and i'm sure you're going to want to ask them questions which will be great and by the way if you have questions during the webinar just ask them in the chat box and what i will do is i i will field your questions to the guests directly as and when they come up and we'll group them and we also have a q a at the end but we may take questions during the webinar as well so let's get started i want to ask you the audience we live in very difficult and changing times and skills are a challenge. So I want to ask you whether you are a teacher or whether you are a student or whether you are a parent, which of these skills in front of you now on the poll is becoming more valuable beyond formal education? Which of these skills do we need to be teaching more of do we need to be learning more of you can choose as many of these on this poll as you wish but choose something choose anything so we have public speaking leadership communication entrepreneurship management creativity teamwork problem solving agility multitasking. So we've got 10 there. We're going to ask everybody today what they think is becoming more important. Because I remember the day, well, many years ago when I was at school, and I don't think we learned any of these. At school, it was what they call the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic. So of course, things have changed since then. We need to keep updating and evolving school, education, and skills. We have a few seconds left on the vote on the polls. The polls are coming in here. Um, as these votes are coming in, Madhu, I don't know if you can see the votes live in front of you, but you've heard the list. Which of these do you think is in demand right now? Which skills do you think really the biggest difference between demand and supply in the market is right now? All the skills um, are, which we have mentioned here are mostly, you know, 21st century skills and uh, each one is required. But if you uh, ask me, you know, uh, which are more in demand, I would uh, go with uh, problem solving, mm. leadership problem solving. and uh, entrepreneurship. Mm. Did they teach that when you were a student at school? None at all. None, none, none. <laughs> none yeah. of them. We come from a different era Absolutely. as well. And Yamada Sensei, yourself, which of these skills do you think is, I mean, you teach at uh, an older age group at university. What, what do you feel we need to teach more to that age group now today? Yes, well, right. Can communication, in particular, deep communication among the people. That is one of the uh, one of the important item because and the, I'm in the engineering school so that and the engineers usually want to clarify yes or no or right or right or bad so that but then human communication is somewhat 
different, like an intermediate communication. Such things is a, one of the... Uh, my, my, my thinking is there is a gap in terms of communication. Excellent. That's, I like the idea of deep communication, especially for engineers as well. That's a real challenge, isn't it? And how do we define that and how do we actually teach that as well? I'm interested here. I'm going to ask the audience now is there's a function on the webinar to put your hands up. Do we have that working at the moment? So if you put communication as one of your answers, I'd like you to put your hand up. So raise your hand, I think, is the button to push. If you raise your hand, if you put communication as one of your answers, would love to know. So we have people raising their hands. It's great to see. Thank you very much. Just like classroom again, isn't it? Put your hands up, everybody. <laughs> yeah. Classroom in the digital age. So if you put your... Thank you very much. If you raise your hand, just so we know like who uh, is out there. So if you raised your hands, what I'm going to ask you now, the next question, if you've got your hands raised, what I would like to do is ask one of you spotlight to tell us why you put communication. So if you raised your hand, keep your hand raised. If you want to for 30 seconds, join the webinar on video and audio. That means you have to have video and audio ready, but we're going to spotlight you. So keep your hands raised. Don't feel that this is a major public speaking engagement. It's only going to be 30 seconds. We're going to talk to you. Um, maybe we can get some of these. We can try a few of them. Are they still got their hands raised? We'll try them. Let's try one at the top. Um, the one I see, and maybe we'll do a couple. Keep your hands raised because I'll ask a couple, maybe. Let's start with the first one. And apologies if I pronounce your name wrong. Harita Lakshmi. Is that correct? Can we get the engineer to set up Harita Lakshmi and just join us for 30 seconds? I would love to talk to Harita Lakshmi. Hello there, Harita Lakshmi. Hi, sir. Oh, hello. You're a student. Yes, sir. I'm a student. How old are you, Harita Lakshmi? Um, I'm 11 years old. Wow. Is this your first webinar? Um, it's Yes, this is my first webinar. Well done for you. Excellent. Great to see you taking the public speaking initiative. And where are you in the world today, Harita Lakshmi? I'm in Tokyo, Japan. Tokyo, Japan. Which part of Tokyo, Japan are you in? Um, I'm in the uh, Nishikasai area, Edokoaku Prefecture. Excellent. Um, did I pronounce your name right first? Yes, sir. You did. <laughs> okay, Harita Lakshmi. Tell me, why did you put communication as a skill that you, like your generation, needs to learn more of? Communication is an important thing everyone should learn. It's because using communication, we can all uh, uh, have ideas. And uh, actually even learn more than actually we learn at school. And communication is really important in the future when we go to the jobs also. Yeah, excellent. For example, if you want to go to an interview and get a job, your speaking is an important thing that you need to know uh, to uh, you know impress the person who's taking the interview for you. So that is also an important thing. Well, it sounds like to me that you don't have any problems with communication. <laughs> For an 11 year old, you have a lot of skill there. So I think it's fantastic that you joined us here today. It's wonderful to see you, Harita Lakshmi. Thank you so much for joining us Thank and goodbye. Good, good luck as well. You sound like you are going to be a future star, maybe. <laughs> Who knows, right? <laughs> let's get another, let's get another audience member in. Let's get Michael Sanaya. I'm sorry if I've pronounced your name wrong, um, but Michael, I'm sure I've got that part right. Should we get Michael in just to have a chat with us? We can get the engineer to set Michael up. Thank you very much, uh, Harita Lakshmi. W wonderful. She was amazing at 11 years old. Mm -hmm. A future star as well. Michael, welcome to the webinar. Do we have you on 
audio would be great to hear you if you can join us maybe tell us why you chose communication is michael there maybe his audio is not working maybe whilst we're waiting for michael we can get what about cedric cedric maybe can we get cedric in let's try that so maybe we can ask cedric to join us and cedric or hopefully i pronounced that right cedric hello there hello good afternoon everyone Hello there, Cedric. Is that a, it? Sounds like a French-sounding name. Where are it you? Is a French-sounding name. I'm based in Tokyo right now. Okay, so you're based in Tokyo. You put communications at your one of your top skills. Tell us about that. So, why well, do you think communications is a skill? You know, I think at least the generation I came from, um, we had phones as a way of communication, but nowadays we have uh, social media. We have uh, instant messaging. Uh, and, and many other type of medias from where we're getting communication, receiving, getting communication. And uh, I think with all that information via these mediums, uh, you, you become quite overwhelmed. And, and the way you, um, you know, convey that to other people, whether it's just these platforms or when it is at work, it, it's a bit overwhelming sometimes. Mm. So I think, I, I think it's really something... Um, that, that is important nowadays. Um, mm -hmm. and, and going back to uh, Yamada Sensei, the deep communication aspects, sometimes we tend being bombarded by so many mediums um, to, to kind of shortcuts on communications. And, and so there is some misunderstanding behind it. Mm -hmm. So I, I did like that, that deep communication aspects uh, that Yamada Sensei did mention. Do you think there's some cultural awareness in that deep communication as well? I mean, imagine you're French living in Japan, you've got probably you've had to learn cultural awareness through your environment right it it, it is definitely uh, yes great that, that is that that plays an important role definitely i'm very envious of all these non-english speakers who can come and do a webinar here or talk in public i think they do such a good job and thank you very much cedric for thank joining you. us i really appreciate that and your insights as well let's take one more um what about madoka sawada so can we get madoka on Let's try Madoka. Hello, Madoka. Are you joining us? Hello there. Yeah. Can we get your hello? Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Thank you for joining us and yes. to the webinar. You said communication is one of the important skills. Tell us why. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, my son belongs to the Nishikasai campus from grade one, and he was very upset about learning English, but I said to him, the communication is very important. So you have to continue to communicate with the school's student. And these days, he's very happy to go mm -hmm. and communicate to all the students in the school. Mm. And you obviously speak very good English. Where did you learn English? I'm a flight att attendant. Ah. <laughs> right. Excellent. Good. But I'm sure your son looks at you as well and probably has a good role model for speaking English. Yeah. You know, we learn so much by looking at parents and teachers as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Madoka, for joining us and doing this in English. Really appreciate that. Well, that was really interesting to hear all your thoughts, folks. Um, you know, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of different challenges that we're facing in education today. Let's have a look. I'd like to maybe get our guests to help us walk through some of the some of these challenges and really what we're faced with. What did you hear? So Madhu yourself, you've you've heard three different um, levels of different people. You've got obviously we started with Lakshmi, the very young 11 year old, all the way up to the parents as well. The kind of things they're saying, how do you package that as a teacher yourself? You hear this every day. What are the concerns that people have right now with skills? So, uh, firstly, I could recognize, you know, Harika Lakshmi. I think she's also a student of Shaya's, TVSE 6. So, so happy to, you know, see that uh, she could communicate her um, thoughts so well. And uh, same I hear from the parent. So definitely, um, as Professor Yamada also pointed out, uh, communication is the skill which is needed in current 
um, century and possibly because uh, you know we, um, everybody is becoming so global and uh, when they need to communicate with different culture different languages so something has to transpire and that deep communication is a really a something amazing which professor yamada brought in so at the same time uh, you see the problem solving skill which possibly i think was rated a little lower than communication mm. skill um, i would like to you know um, say something about this skill as uh, as you know you know it's unpredictable future these days and people do not uh, know what uh, jobs they would be going for and the real world challenges which they face so problem solving skill also comes in in uh, in in you know a great value so a few decades ago of course excellence was to be defined by you know just uh, having talent within the classroom getting good academic results and passion uh, which uh, was defined by talent outside the classroom you know um, so the scale and meaning for excellence and talent is changing now so today's education is primarily you know both the worlds it's measured by innate talent that exceeds academic output Mm. so be it communication skills problem solving or other skills which i see of course they are all relevant skills so all this um, becomes very very important for us as educators and not coming from a generation alpha you see we are coming from a generation when these children were not even born so to realize them and calibrate global calibration required in terms of what the education their educational needs are and uh, get them prepared be facilitators rather than you know teachers and educators so that's what is uh, required mm. facilitation really. is yeah, yeah. the key word here isn't it rather than sort of very traditional impressing information upon people and hopefully them remembering it so i think what we're going to do now is let's do this let's uh, i'm going to maybe ask you to tell us a story about an example of how you actually teach this how do you teach communication problem solving and, and and so on and then we will go into the world from industry we will look at concepts which industry has used for many many years to solve problems and we may feel that that's a world apart you know especially in japan which is so you know is famous for quality management and Toyota philosophy of production and Kaizen, all these ideas which have really driven quality and produced some of the world's most reliable cars. And so we have industry here and education here, and we're going to try and bring these together today and ask the question, what kind of school education do we need to create for not just students, but for society as well. So that's the challenge we're going to look at and the journey we're on today. So let's bring up this picture. I want to share a picture and then ask Madhu to talk about the context of this. This is not actually the picture we, we are going to specifically talk about. But now let's go to the school bus picture so we can scroll forward. So here we have kids getting on a school bus here. Now, that's a pretty easy challenge to solve kids just have to get onto the school bus but not when you have a lot of school buses and a lot of kids right so Madhu, tell us about the context of this story and then you know we want to break it down and this is you know how do you use this as a, as a story to teach problem solving so what's the problem first tell us about what happened in gis campus then this this fit brings me to a memory of one particular problem which the students were facing in one of the GIS campus. And um, it goes like this, that the school has close to 100 buses, the parking space is limited, and we need to ensure that the buses pick up the children within 10 minutes and without disturbing the residence community around it, they move out and there is hardly any parking space. And children need to board the right bus. And these are young five-year-old, six-year-old, seven-year-old children. And um, as, a, um, 
as a system in school we in, had introduced quality circles so i will just later on you know talk a little more about it uh, so as a part of the quality circles the student identified this problem that they had to run to find the right space where their bus is parked so they came up with a very simple solution for it through the very scientific technique called nominal group technique you know using brainstorming using nominal group technique using uh, ishikawa or that is you know um, root cause identifying the root cause of the problem so the problem is that they need to identify the right bus within a very short duration so children are genius and they come out with creative ideas which are very simple solutions and that's what the world wants nobody wants a complex world so they came up with a simple white board and magnets to identify the bus numbers so all they had to do was plot the numbers against the space and the children had to just walk out of the school compound see where the bus number is parked where is the magnet they could all read numbers so okay bus number 14 so they moved to bus number 14 it was a very simple solution and very effective very effective and what brought that solution was not just a random brainstorming so primarily they used uh, a technique called nominal group technique and this technique i i'm sure you know anybody who um, in, in the in the adult uh, uh, world in industry you know people are familiar with um and this kind of technique where there is a identification of a problem and then there is a brainstorming on on the uh, finding what is the what is the problem they need to work upon so and then coming up with a um technique to find a solution to the problem so this is what uh, children in school are doing these days i don't see this happening you know 20 years ago or even 30 years ago in our times um how, how old were these children that were involved in this project what range 7 8 year old 7 or 8 years old wow eight years come on like, i'm sure people are thinking come on like the, yeah, the parent the, the parents <laughs> the teachers came up with the answers it's like homework or assignments the parents do them So surely the teachers came up with it and then the the students just took the glory surely you don't want us to believe this that 7 or 8 year olds can solve problems like this no i i believe you know um, how the paradigm is shifting from you know teacher led teacher centric education to student centric so the student agency that is their voice and choice comes in to play nowadays hmm. and they are asked to you know identify things they are asked what is actually you know needed for for learning for their learning so so this is definitely very you know has worked very well so um, hmm. and this brings in you know enhancing creativity this brings in enhancing communication when they are talking to each other they are putting their ideas on paper or convincing each other within the group that my idea is you know a uh, better than yours so yeah. so all the real world right communication and problem solving and creativity enhancing creativity and then putting it in action you know all these skills come into play excellent that's a great story i love it and such a good example as well and great to hear that 7 or 8 year olds can do this because it just goes to show that with the right structure and the right environment everything is possible right so let's park that and now switch gears a little bit and i'm using obviously car terms for a reason here now we are in japan and we are going to bring in the aspect of industry into this and then see how we can apply this to education because one may ask like can you apply these ideas from industry into education and what can we learn what can we learn as educators and what can we learn as parents and the students here today what can they learn from this as well so let's now talk about this concept of total quality management now if you have studied anything about japan 
and industry from the last 50 years, this will come up in conversation because it's what Japan is famous for and it's what Japan led the world in, in from the post-war generation onwards, really. And we know about companies like Toyota and Honda and the success that they've had as a result of really just constant quality improvement and a system. So let's talk about that first. And we have Yamada Sensei here to help us understand total quality management. I want to flash up this screen next, which is probably what everybody thinks of, not the bus one, but that one. Yes. <laughs> the production line. But this is, tell us about where total quality management came from, Yamada Sensei, mm -hmm. and also what you do with it on a daily basis at university. Okay. So thank you very much. Uh, at the beginning, I would like to introduce the origin of the total quality management. And it was 1920s, 1920s in United States. And uh, she had developed techniques of quality control. It is called as quality control. And he proposed a method to monitor the process as well as a concept. Such methodology, statistical methodology and concept has had been imp imported to Japan after World War II. And uh, as you know, Japan was defeated in World War II. Therefore, 90, after the World War II, almost nothing in Japan. Mm. The only way to survive is to be industrialized right. countries because Japan has no natural resources, because Japan is very small island. When you reshape the Japanese island, it is 600 kilometers square. In, even 600 kilometers square and 100 million persons are living. So, and Japan tried to be an industrialized and industrialized countries and I don't know exactly what has happened because I was born in 1964. Today, I'm, I'm 56 years old. Mm. I still remembering like a 1970s, Japanese product has failure. I want to introduce my experience. When I, and my mother said, we are lucky because our TB doesn't have failure. Mm. So she said lucky because usually TV has a failure. However, our TV did not have a failure. Therefore, she said we are lucky. Just only 50 years ago, products are, Japanese products are very, very, uh, well, not so good in the current days. Failure, yes, failure occurs com very commonly. And previous persons like Madusan says Ishikawa. He was a guru of the quality management. And then Jap many Japanese companies tried to be an industrialized countries. And various philosophy, but I want to introduce two major philosophy of quality management born in such era, like 1980s. Number one is respect humanity. Respecting humanity to, and they respect humanity and they try to promote small group activity as a part of education. And this is number one. And number two, second point is that, and the quality should be made by all employees. 1980s or 90s, typical mindset in US is that quality is a job for quality department. <laughs> but a simple example is that, and the, and the sales department knows the customer well. So cust what customer want knows the sales department person. So quality is that, and many company has been implemented quality as a company wide activities. And current days, no failure, it's um, common. And it is very difficult. So, and the quality management should be deployed to other industry, like a service industry and wide viewpoint. At that time, and I, I had, I, I was very lucky to 
and get a chance to collaborate with GIIS to start quality activities. Yeah, well, I want to ask you about this. Let's get this next slide. This is going to be what the audience is thinking. How is this possible? If we show two slides down, this mm -hmm. one here, next yes. one, next, we've done, okay. Yes, quality management, Yamada Sensei works with cars, works with television sets, mm. but children and students and teachers, no, surely it doesn't work. Tell me, what, what did you find mm. applying this to education? Yes, it's a challenge. First, from the viewpoint of the school, we have to define who are the customer of the education. And school and student is a very important stakeholder. Parent is also an important stakeholder. However, we should focus not only student and parent, but also we have to look at the society, what society requires. So when the first point is that we need to have wide viewpoint and currently as yes, in the business field, SDG, Sustainable okay. Devel Development Goals are uh, emphasized. The reason is that loan and from the business perspective, don't look at the financial aspect only. And we need to have a wide viewpoint, like a, to be sustainable, to be sustainable. Mm -hmm. So this is the first point. And the first, we need to have wide viewpoint and second it's a technical one and the process standardization of education education is uh, is based on the communication based well for example i'm teaching quality management at my school i'm looking at the face of the student and if their face is good I go ahead. However, if the face is questionable, I stop and rephrase again. So that, and the process, process flow is completely different manufacturing sector. In case of manufacturing, process flow is very simple. First, put parts one, second, put part two, third, put part three, and the finally inspect it. Process flow is and simple. On the other hand, education, teacher have to adapt the student learning. So that process flow cannot be written precisely. On the other hand, one year basis, we need to have process flow. So, and the appropriate process flow have to be considered. This is the second point. Mm. But, uh, but I, I think the important thing is that Respecting humanity is a foundation as well as a manufacturing industry. Mm. So, and the, on the other, in, in addition to that, in, man, in the past, quality is a job for all department. The same thing in case of education. Education quality can be achieved by all stakeholders attend, attendance. Mm. That's my thinking. That's great. That's a great scene setter. Madhu, when you hear about quality in education, what exactly is that? Let's talk about how you apply that. Is that quality of exam results? What does it mean to you? So as uh, Professor Yamada has rightly pointed out, you know, uh, that um, we need to uh, ensure that we are, you know, creating respect for humanity and uh, Primarily, it is the, it's not just a machine, you know, which can be switched on and switched off and something improved. So our, um, our my uh, thought process is that we have to catch them young. You know, this phrase is very appropriate when we talk about quality management in school because they are the cradle for human race. They would be the ones who would, you know, grow up to be global citizens. And to catalyze their attitude, you know, or change or promote any kind of, um, whether it is leadership development or problem solving skills. So then uh, bringing in this uh, aspect of quality management um, within 
within the school system becomes very pertinent and it it uh, the students must be able to you know take new information process it in a way that it is you know um, ready uh, related to what they already know and also have you know deeper understanding of the matter that means have a deeper understanding of how they could be able to solve the problem and as the in the industry and japan has been you know leading in this process of kaizen so continuous improvement um, comes through kaizen so they need not like kaizen is you know you need not wait for something to be you know broken in order to be fixed rather than improve the current process and basically you know it is learning by doing and learning by doing you know education it is an educational phrase it's an educational pedagogy that mm -hmm. you learn by doing and bring that into uh, the regular school system bring it into the curriculum bring it into every aspect the student uh, or and uh, or the teacher does it one other uh, uh, example which comes to my mind or a story uh, as he said that it has to be at with all stakeholders so it doesn't end with students even teachers so usually you know the typical problems students or teachers face in school is how we can improve student discipline how we can improve cleanliness how we can reduce waste in the school be it you know water or electricity or how we would you know reduce stress mental stress or how we improve communication parent teacher communication these are the typical um, um, issues the students identify or even teachers identify so one such simple uh, practice which teachers uh, brought in uh, through their uh, quality circle was how do we improve parent teacher communication or how do we improve parent school communication so usual the usual setup of a parent teacher meeting is okay we fix an appointment you come in i tell you about how your child has done and you you are already familiar with the mass of the students so essentially you haven't learned anything more than what you already knew so uh, it's uh, then how do you bring a change hmm. so then comes what what changes you know metrics what are the measures whether hmm. the the teacher should not just talk she sh she needs to have statistics or she or he needs to have statistical data what are the parameters where the child is learning whether and and the child has to be a part of it so it begins with a pre survey of what the parent would like to know it also begins with some information already shared with the parent be in the be it you know in the form of um, student goal plan or student improvement plan and be it in the form of what queries the parents would ask so there is a pre survey of the ptm then comes the ptm where in it is a three way conference there is a student and the parent and the teacher and they sit together with certain metrics in hand the students improvement plan or students growth plan is there the child has identified what are his he's done his swot strength hmm. weakness opportunities and what he needs to do how he how the ownership shifts from the parent and teacher to the child identifies what are the learning goals how i will achieve them can my parents support me i mean they could support with with uh, you know letting the child learn the certain skills how the teacher will support and that's how you know the learning comes in mm. so it's a total shift in the in the way learning is done these days no oh, i like it though i like to hear this and i think the pain point of those parent teacher meetings that we've all experienced as parents or teachers or students as well and you know on both sides both the parents and the teachers want to improve because they like you say you, you go to the meeting and then the teacher feels compelled to talk so for the seven minutes that you have with the teacher until the next parent they have to get everything out but it's all written down anyway i'm into very curious about the use of data as well i'm sure parents are as well because that really helps in managing and making change and, and 
you know, you can't, as they say, you know, you can't hit a target unless you can see it, right? So if you set some data points for teachers, for the students, and they take ownership of the data, then everybody is a stakeholder in making constant improvement, which is the Kaizen part as well. So I think moving this forward, I mean, it's great to hear these examples as well. I'm sure a lot of this is also work in progress. It's a very new area in education. So, you know, we're following very closely what you, um, both of you are working on at GIS as well. I'm very keen to learn about this. I'm sure the parents amongst us here and even the, the students as well are probably asking, what do we do in this? You talk about stakeholders and surely that means us as well. And, you know, what do I need to do? Do I need to learn data analytics? Do I need to learn total quality management? Um, I'm very busy already. I have kids. Yeah. You know, it's a very much a full-time occupation. What, what can I do as a parent to be better involved in this and more informed and get a better result in this? What, what advice would you give to parents, Madhu? And I'd also be interested to hear the same um, answer, did, well, same, ask the same question to Yamada sensei as well. From the parents' perspective, what do we need to think about as well as, you know, wider society perspective? And then also after that, we'll hand out for questions and answers from everybody here today in terms of the content that's come up from the audience. So Madhu, yourself, I'm a parent. What do I need to know about this? How do I get involved? And how can I use this information to create a better outcome for me and for the student? So uh, what I would share with you is nothing new. You already know it, but uh, just to articulate it again, I think parents, of course, uh, the current parents are also Generation Z parents. They are Generation X parents, you know, and they they have also changed from the you know parent the parenting which used to happen earlier you know is has totally changed so just a just a reminder or just something you know which works every time and under all circumstances for any any kind of uh, um, at any uh, uh, area is that you lead by example engage with your child you know it's all about communication like professor said deep communication so engagement with the child um, be very cautious of social media ensure that you follow through if the feedback comes to you if the if, if the school is giving a feedback or the teacher is giving a feedback essentially the teacher has an experience of handling 100 odd kids and definitely the teacher will be better, uh, you know, uh, skilled in uh, in and handling the students. So uh, follow through what what and be supportive, encourage your child at the same time. Make sure, you know, that uh, if the child thinks differently is OK, you need to support and see that these data points do not stifle the child's goal plans mm. so data is very important but data should lead to the the dream or the goal which the child has set for himself or possibly identify his you know um, his uh, uh, what he would like to do in future so uh, these are certain things which you know i can repeat as a mm. as a educator and uh, this will go a long way in in connecting with your child not only through his school education, but, you know, uh, having a deep connect with him throughout the life. You're mm. there, but you are not, um, but you allow the child to grow. Mm. I like yeah. the point about data as well, not being the goal, but, you know, being a stepping stone to a bigger goal. You should be an enabler because I think people can look at data and that becomes the goal in itself. Especially so it's not just that academic goals, uh, Graham, it would be, you know, goals on the entire holistic uh, approach which a school takes any uh, these days you know whether it is personality development nowadays metrics is available for each and every aspect of it mm -hmm. be it personality development be it you know your um, uh, the way you uh, look at your sports speed hours and all these are available lot of a uh, lot of technologies available to measure um, how how sports are done or be it you know your uh, even even the 
cultural, whether the child is able to adapt and learn certain habits or certain, you know, honesty or um, certain skills, certain universal values which are mm. required. There are there is metrics for everything. So use these metrics, but at the same time use them as an inference to, you know, connect with your child. A guide, yeah. And a guide. Excellent. Well, that that is great advice. Before I ask Yamada Sensei as well, the um, if you have questions, you can ask questions in the chat box down there. We don't have a lot of time left, so we're going to ask Yamada Sensei. Um, for his thoughts as well. And then if we have any questions, we'll ask those. Mm -hmm. And then at the end, I'll give you some pointers as what you can do to register for the next webinar. So stick around for the, the end so you can get the link to register for the next webinar so you don't have to come back and do that. You can do it all in one as well as how you can get access to the podcast. Yamada Sensei, if we use total quality management in education with success, what does the future look like? Have you thought about how this can change education in the same way you know, total quality management changed your mum's TV set, you know, from something that was broken or not in your case, you had the outlier, but you know, it changed industry. Like you say, even the seventies to the eighties in Japan was a big change. Mm -hmm. What do you think about with, education what will the impact of total quality management be on education in the next 10 or 20 years yes I, i'm thinking that fundamental philosophy is the same with the manufacturing industry like and respecting humanity to contribute to society these things but how part is different for example in, when i was a student i was reading a paper book I was using a notebook, I was using the pencil. But the current days and online education is becoming popular. It's a, and, and how to teach is completely different. So that, and we need to change the standardized process to uh, be an excellent school. So that my understanding is that Final goal or eventual goal is the same, like uh, humanity contribute to society, etc. But then uh, adapting the current status, for example, typical uh, idea is application of IT. And such things can be done smoothly by implementing TQM because the purpose of TQM is not to implement the TQM. Purpose is to be an excellent school. Current years, an excellent school use the IT technology efficiently to make the student society happier. That is the final goal. So that how part, how to teach and how to deploy all over the GIS or all over the school, that, that can be different. This is my thinking. Mm, it's exciting. I've got some questions for you. Mm. So, um, Maybe we'll separate this question. This is a, this is a question asked from the audience, um, directed to Yamada Sensei. Is what type of quality management is expected from twelve years old? For example, sports, music, education. So, first one: Can we expect quality management for twelve-year-olds? Does it have an impact in sports? Let's take sports for example, or music. Yes, I think the. Uh, and one of the I uh, yes, mm, very tough question. I'm I'm facing with an 18 years old student. <laughs> in okay, I'll ask I'll ask Madhu that one then because obviously this is something you know more about. Madhu yourself, yeah, but, mm. what about yourself? 12 years old? Is it relevant? An interesting question and very relevant. Very relevant question. Um, when we talk about as professor said total quality management is not about just tqm it is about how do how we do things hmm. so when we say how the how part has to be defined very clearly I, if you are a science student you know then you know by nature i am a i am a science student so you know it comes very naturally that you uh, use um, facts 
depth, you do observation skills, you do um, uh, analytical skills, and then you do some research, and then you come out with, uh, you know, what you are uh, learning. So similar thing, similar concept applies to whether when you are doing a quality management in in terms of sports. Sports is the easiest way to answer. I am a child. I learn. I have started. I have my interest in soccer because. so and so is my you know uh, is my role model and i want to do soccer i i go and join a soccer club what do i do there do i spend one hour just learning techniques okay fine what am i aiming at and how i would achieve there is a process to it and that process hmm. defines tqm so as a child the, it is it doesn't need to be you know any explanations or definitions of tqm but the thought process of how i would take this challenge convert it into tangible goals and uh, tangible uh, the goals which can be defined which have certain measures so i say okay i will improve my soccer if i am doing 15 minutes i will do 30 minutes maybe i need that i will improve my technique of holding the ball so i i write down and then i work on it so primarily it is the process which the child learns so it is nothing to define tqm but how i learn it so whether i and when i learn it what are my metrics over up 6 months over one year and mm. where would i want to achieve so it it kind of defines things with with definite you know uh, values and mm. metrics and measures and that's what is uh, you know uh, for for uh, that's what is quality management for a child mm. if i am faced with certain problem how do i solve it do i solve it by just telling my mother or my teacher or do i really think of an innovative way yes i can think out of the box i can do lateral thinking and how that learning of lateral thinking is kind of you know doing quality management Mm. Yeah, then we've got a lot to learn as well. I'm conscious of the time, folks. We're running out here of the time, so let me tell you how you can sign up and join us for the next chapter in the journey of the Global Schools Foundation into the school of the future. Today, we all learned about. Quality management, total quality management, and we learned a bit about the school of the future from today. What's happening today? And obviously, Yamada Sensei and Madhu were fantastic guides for us today. Really enjoyed the conversation today. Hopefully, you did too. If you join, enjoyed the conversation, then um, let us know. Let us know in the chat box and say what you thought of today's conversation. If you think it's something that you'd like to learn more about for your child or for yourself as a student or as an educator as well, we'd love to hear your thoughts. Apologies, we can't take all the questions today because we're running out of the time. But what you can do is take your phone and scan that QR code in front of you, and that will get you onto the next episode. Sign up already. Register there, and there's a link in the chat box as well. If you, QR code maybe is a bit too sci-fi, science fiction for you,、uh, go and get the link from the chat box. There, great to hear all your feedback and your comments as well. Really enjoyed the session. Thank you very much for your comments. Get in the chat box if you want that link to the next one. Just click that link and register. It's dead easy. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments and your feedback as well. Lots of positive feedback coming through. Thank you for this valuable session. Yeah. Well, thank you for your valuable insights. And not only were the panelists wonderful today, but also the audience. We had the audience. We had three audience members here on video and audio. That was great. And and well done to the first one. And. I can't remember exactly. Nikita Lakshmi was that right? Something like that. I'm sorry if I got that wrong, but you were wonderful. Just aged 11, I think you were the star of the show today. You took it all, and well done. I'm sure we're going to see you on a future webinar as well.、Um, thank you for this valuable session. Wonderful session. Thank you so much. Looking forward to attending the next. Yeah, we're looking forward to having you on the next session. Thank you very much. This was interesting. I would like to thank everybody that joined us today, Global Schools Foundation, and our. Guests today, Madhu and Yamada Sensei. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you very you were, much. You were great. You. Really enjoyed the conversation. I feel this is a beginning. I feel that there is. This is not the end of the story of total quality management in education. 
And there is so much more to learn, isn't there? We're really on chapter one of that story. We've written so many books on total quality management already, Yamada Sensei. This is a new book which we're writing about education. Looking forward to that and looking forward to ongoing conversations. And maybe you will both come back and join us on this webinar at some point in the future for a part two, an update with some of your stories to share. Looking forward to that very much. Everybody, have yourself a wonderful afternoon or evening wherever you are in the world. Stay safe. Thank you for joining us. And we'll see everybody for the next chapter, part four. Have a good day.